Shalom, everybody. God bless you, and thank you so very, very much for joining us for our Father's Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, it is a blessing to be with you. I'm Pastor Scott Villane with Holy Impact Ministries, and we have a tremendous study for you this evening. Uh, and uh, again, you know, when we have these studies, as we are walking through the New Testament and as we are studying out uh, these books, uh, it is important for us to always understand that uh, just as the Bible tells us, there is nothing new under the sun. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today concerning the fact that there is nothing new under the sun. And we're going to be talking a little bit about what we today as modern day Christians need to be on the lookout for when we see everything that's going on out there in the news and, and uh, all of these things that are going on politically, which God is indeed involved in and watching very closely, I might add, uh, you cannot exclude God from politics or from any other aspect of mankind. Uh, and to do so is very foolish, uh, again, as, as some do. Uh, we urge them to rethink that whole process. Uh, the idea that God is not in the affairs of men is absurd, uh, according to the very Bible itself. And we're going to see that here today uh, as well. So, uh, once again, everybody, uh, getting into the 10th chapter of the book of Luke, uh, and we're going to be looking at the importance of parables, why there are parables, does God love everybody uh, all the time, uh, and is this... Uh, uh, this uh, idea that everybody is going to get to heaven their own way, uh, is, is, there, is there any validity to this? Is there any solid foundation uh, within Scripture that, that uh, teaches such a thing? Or is that teaching essentially demonic? Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about all of these things here today. Uh, and uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to say welcome. Welcome to everybody out there at YouTube, everybody at Facebook, everybody at Odyssey, everybody at the Holy Impact Ministries website, wherever it is that you're watching this from. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for watching and thank you for sharing your time with us here uh, this evening. Uh, I do have a couple of announcements that I wanted to make before we get started here. The first one is that... Uh, Brother Tim, who we have been praying for, he has uh, apparently what the doctors are saying is some kind of cancer in his esophagus. And uh, so he has been going through a couple of different surgeries. He now has what they call a J-tube feeding him uh, now because he has not been able to eat anything for the last couple of months. He is at home now. Uh, and so we're very thankful for that. And he is uh, being able to have at least some form of comfort and being able to get some, some rest now, finally. Uh, but uh, again, and we want to keep him in prayer as well. Please keep the uh, Tim Bryant family in prayer uh, and pray without ceasing concerning uh, these things. Uh, again, Brother Tim's been with us in our assembly for many years. Good, solid, true Bible studying brother. And so we need to pray for him and pray for Sister Rosemary and Tim Jr. and uh, and April, his wife and his family and children as well. The, the whole family, please, my friends, pray that uh, our Father in Heaven surrounds that family with his angels and, and guides that family as to what they should do next. Also, I wanted to mention Sister Judy as well. Not been feeling very well. Went to the doctors, has high blood pressure, and so she is now battling high blood pressure on top of everything else. Uh, we want to keep her in prayer as well. Not been feeling very well. Uh, and now her the the virus that she had, they think she may have pneumonia in her lungs. Uh, one of her eardrums was actually blown out due to that, we believe. Uh, and her son now has this same thing, what, whatever this thing is. Uh, there's so much of this going around. Uh, we want to pray for Sister Judy and her family and her son uh, as well, who is now sick. She's watching the grandchildren on top of being uh, sick and not feeling very well. So please keep her uh, in prayer as well. And so many of our brothers and sisters out there who are coming down with all of these different kinds of things that are going around as the Bible said that they would. We're going to get a little bit more into that today. We're going to talk a little bit about maybe the, even the, uh, the eclipse that is coming on Monday. Once again, we already have teachings out on that. If you have not seen those, please visit us uh, at our Holy Impact Ministries website or our Holy Impact Ministries YouTube channel or our Holy Impact Ministries Rumble channel. You'll be able to find all those videos there uh, very easily. Um, 
but uh, we might talk, touch on that a little bit uh, this evening as well. Uh, because it is coming up in, in just a couple of days. My friends, if, if there is any doubt in your mind that the God of Israel does indeed exist and is still in control, uh, I want you to go outside Monday and I want you to look up and I want you to know and I want you to understand that there is only one who can cause a Paleo-Hebrew Aleph and Tav to be written across the face of the United States. And that is going to be completed this coming Monday, April 8th. I know you've heard a ton of things about the April 8th eclipse. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, the internet is infiltrated with uh, the April 8th eclipse. And many people saying it's the end of the world and ridiculous things. And other people having some very intelligent things to say uh, about that eclipse coming up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and we'll probably talk about that Friday on the Valane Report, uh, Friday morning or Friday afternoon as well. Uh, but for now, uh, I just wanted everybody to uh, don't forget to pray for Brother John also, who had received a new set of lungs, is, is coming back strong. We want to make sure that we continue to pray for him and give thanks for our pray prayers being answered concerning him being able to, to come back uh, and to be uh, what he used to be and to be able to get up on his feet and to be able to move around and just breathe uh, is just a, a, a miraculous uh, sign of God and the technology that God has given us to be able to do these things. Uh, this has just been a real blessing for us to watch. And so once again, please pray for uh, Brother John Cope as well. Uh, so with that being said, um, we are calling this April 8th, which is Monday, uh, from uh, Sunday sundown to Monday sundown, we are calling for a fast. Uh, if you would please fast with us and pray for this nation and pray for the assembly of God, who this message is for. My friends, this, this message is not only a shot across the bow to the wicked. It is also a sign, a warning to God's assembly to prepare. To prepare. Not for a whisking away or a pre-tribulation rescue, but to prepare for the persecution that is coming my friends. Again, if you have not seen our uh, our study on the April 8th uh, eclipse, you need to go back, you need to watch that, you need to read your Bible above all things so that you may know and understand what this is all about truly. Uh, I want to say also before we get started here as well, I'm going to go over to the website. I want to say thank you to all of our Patreons that are out there, uh, whether you be part of our Patreon uh, uh, list or whether you are just giving uh, through snail mail or, or PayPal or however you're doing that. Uh, we want to come down here and we want to say thank you so very, very much uh, for doing that. Again, we do not sell the Word of God at Holy Impact Ministries. You're never going to find us selling any of our docu-studies or any of our studies or anything else. If you get something in the mail saying, uh, Holy Impact Ministries wants you to buy this study or buy that, you know that's not from us. Uh, that is a hack. You, you need to delete that immediately <laughs> and don't pay any attention to it. Excuse me. And so once again, my friends, uh, the way that we survive is a team effort. It's, it's together. We have certain people within the ministry uh, that do look after the work, good work that we are doing, and we cannot thank our Father in Heaven enough for those people and those families uh, who are supporting uh, this work that we are doing. Thank you so very, very much from the bottom of our hearts. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. It is the beginning of a new month. And uh, we are, uh, as of uh, April 8th, a, a, again, a new moon will be uh, hanging in dark in the sky, and we will begin another new month, a uh, second new month of God's new year. And yes, I said second, not first. Uh, for those of you who do not understand, uh, please go back and watch our Passover videos, and that will explain all of that to you and what the Bible says about when his Passover is and when his Passover is not. Uh, very important information for everyone to know. And again, uh, it is line by line, line by line, precept by precept, precept by precept. It comes directly from the Bible, not any man's calendar, not any man's writings, not any man's commentary, not from a rabbi, not from a pope. It comes from the Bible and the Bible alone. That's what we teach here. If that's what you're looking for, you are in the right place.
So uh, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. It means so very, very much to us. Uh, this evening's Bible study is going to have a lot to do with uh, a concept rarely ever taught within the confines of today's modern day churches. And believe it or not, the wrath of God that does indeed exist, by the way, is something that many people around the world will have to deal with at some point in time. I'd like us to consider what is written in the book of Malachi, and I'd like to read Malachi here very quickly here, and uh, let's go over here to our PowerPoint, uh, and we'll start there. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 5 says this, God, speaking to Israel, says, I have loved you, says Yehovah, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau, Jacob's brother, declares Yehovah, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Adam says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, Yahovah of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom Yahovah is angry forever. My friends, if you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, I want you to highlight this. This idea that God loves everyone all the time is nothing more than a, uh, a dogma taught by churchianity. And it is not of the Bible, and we need to stop teaching and preaching such things. Again, he says, if Adam says, uh, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, Yahuwah of God says, they may build. But I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country, and the people with whom Yahovah is angry for how long? Forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is Yahovah beyond the border of Israel. Is God great beyond the border of Israel? You bet, my friends. And there's a lot we've got to learn, and we've got a short time to get there. If you've been led to believe that God loves everyone all the time, you may want to think again, and if you call yourself a pastor and think that because you are a pastor that this means that God loves you forever and for always, you'd better think again. This evening's study will be about parables and why Yeshua spoke in parables and not directly to the people, but it will also be about who is accepted in the eyes of God and who is not. And if you've been shamefully taught that everyone will be accepted, you clearly have not been reading your Bible. And I tell you the truth, sitting as a pew warmer within the confines of any one of over thousands of different denominational empires, all of which have been built and created by men and their charters of men, is not going to bring you into the good graces of God without your ability to understand what the biblical definition of the love of God truly is found in 1 John 5, 3, which once again was taught, demonstrated, and explained in great detail by the true Passover Lamb of God who was, is, and always will be Yeshua, Jesus in the Greek. For more information on this deception and many others like it, I encourage you to stay well grounded within the proper context of your Bible. And if you need a glimpse at what you may have been missing by not reading your Bible, I encourage you to stay with us this evening as we once again teach and preach what is clearly written within the confines of our god breed Scripture and our god breed Scripture alone. Stay with us. We'll be right back after the break.
Over the past few weeks, we've been studying the 70 disciples that Yeshua had sent out into the world to proclaim the soon coming kingdom of God. And we spoke in some detail about how he had sent them out into the world with no money pack, pack at all, no wallet, no knapsack, or even any sandals. And we spoke about how he commanded them to bring their peace upon the households that they visited. But that if any one of those households would not receive them, they were to brush the dust off of their feet and move along, for it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it would be for that town and for that household. But now in Luke chapter 10, the 70 have returned, and they have returned well educated in knowing what it means to spread the light and to be the salt of the earth. The education that they had gained from that rather short outing not only showed them the power of God, but it also showed them the rejection of the world and the fact that not everyone was going to gain entrance into God's kingdom. And here in Luke chapter 10, verse 21 through 24, we see Yeshua rejoicing in the Father's will being done. What was the Father's will? Was the Father's will to save everyone, no matter how evil or how despotic? You may be surprised to know the truth. I'd like to begin this evening by opening the books to Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 24. Let's do that. Again, Luke chapter 10. And let me get over here. It doesn't look like this is going to work. Okay, so I'm going to have to do it manually. Okay, merge. There we go. Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 24 says this, In that same hour he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, Thank you, Father, Yahuwah God of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Let me stop here just for a moment. I want to read, read that. If you don't have this highlighted in your Bible, very important scripture. Very important scripture. Next time somebody tells you we're all getting to heaven our own way, I want you to present to them Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Again, it says, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, and he said, Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you, God, have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Did God hide the message from the wise? He most certainly did. And he revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then, turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Does he say, bless everyone's eyes? Isn't that what, he, isn't that what the church teaches? That, oh, everybody, no matter what you've done, God loves you, right? Isn't that, isn't that what? Is, is that, why, why is Yeshua not preaching that right here in Luke chapter 10? Let's read it again. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what your eyes see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Within the confines of the book of Luke itself, there are several parables that Yeshua uses to teach his apostles, and we've been going through some of them, and uh, right after this paragraph, we go into the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we're going to go into another parable. So, it is important for us to understand what these parables mean. Yeshua uses parables to teach his apostles the spiritual meaning of God's commandments and the significance of God's commandments and what they mean for the existence and for the longevity of mankind. Again, my friends, I would remind everybody that it is clearly written that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. A parable is a way of delivering a message without being direct. Parables are a way of speaking metaphorically, some might say, uh, almost like a riddle or a rhyme that causes a person to stop and to think in order to understand what it is that the speaker is attempting to say. Now, that's a very technical way 
of explaining what a parable is, but I tell you the truth, my friends. Our Messiah didn't speak metaphorically as much as he did spiritually. When our Messiah spoke, he spoke in spiritual ways to stir the spirit of God that was in his chosen, set-apart, remnant people. And it was because of Yeshua's constant foretelling of these parables that the apostles came to him one day and they asked him, they said, you know, outright, they said, why is it that, that you speak in these ways? Why do you speak in parables to the people? Why don't you speak directly to the people? And Yeshua's answer to why he spoke in parables clearly shows us that Yeshua, when he spoke to the masses, was not speaking to everyone. Now, that may sound like a shock to many who have always been taught that God loves everyone, no matter who you are or no matter what you've done. But I tell you the truth. The Bible has much to say about the love of God, that many, just like those who are unable to understand the parables of Yeshua, do not understand about the God of Israel. Let's begin by going back to where it was that the apostles came to Yeshua in order to ask him about why he spoke in parables. We can find that in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Let's go there now. Again, very important scripture for us to know. And we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, and let's read this for ourselves. Then the disciples came and they asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he said to them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, in other words, the one who has been seeking, asking, seeking, and knocking, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, who could care less and hasn't been asking, seeking, and knocking about anything, to him even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their uh, ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Clearly, according to our God-breathed scripture, there is an us and there is a them. For some people, because of their wickedness and their denial of the one true Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God himself has given them a debased mind so that they can no longer understand the truth and so be saved. Says who? Says our God-breathed scripture. Roman. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Again, let's read that. Make sure we know we're standing on solid ground. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips. They are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I'd like to stop for a moment here and ask you this question. 
Have you ever witnessed a professing Christian voraciously and relentlessly arguing with someone over their faith or their religion, whether it be in person or whether it be on social media? Have you ever witnessed such a thing going on? Why do you suppose Christians today do such a thing? If God has turned that person over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done, and we think we're going to rush in and save that person, are we not fighting against God? Why do we think that our Messiah told the Seventy when they went out to let their peace fall upon the home that they visited, and if that home would reject them, to just brush off the dust and keep moving? so that they wouldn't be fighting against God. I tell you the truth, they do such things because they themselves are ignorant of their own God-breed scriptures. Were the disciples not told that if their peace did not rest upon a household that they were to brush off the dust off of their feet and continue on? Were they told to stand and argue or to bicker or to yell or to belittle someone or to stomp their feet and tear their clothes? or literally badger someone to death, or to beat them over the head with a club until they submitted to God's word. Is that what they were told to do? Is, is, where's that example in the Bible? Were they told to stand on a street corner and scream and shout and belittle everyone around? Is that what they were told to do? The answer to that question is resounding, no. But there's another side to this coin as well that we need to grasp here this evening. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever heard about President Joe Biden turning the so-called Christian festival of Easter into a day of remembrance for the sexually immoral? I have uh, a clip here that I am going to try to play for you here, and uh, I did not remember to load this. Give me just a second, and uh, I will load this up here. Uh, again, a very important clip here. Uh, this is Lou Dobbs from Lindell TV, and he's talking about what Joe Biden did to Easter. Is this important for us to know? It is important for us to know. Please listen closely to what is going on in our world today. Great to be back with you. Let me guarantee you it is great. Or did I ever dream this Let nation? Let me play that again. Hold Marxist on. Just Dems like, trying to, great to be back again. with you. Go. Let me guarantee you it is great. Joe Biden and the Marxist Dems trying to turn Easter into transgression Sunday. He did his worst. I have to tell you, not in my worst nightmare did I ever dream this nation would have a president who could be so evil, so hateful, so downright satanic. On the holiest day of the year for Christians, Joe Biden declared Easter to be Transgender Day of Visibility. He knew what he was doing, presumably. His wife knew. All of his advisors and the Marxist Dems who make up the cabal who are the masters of this puppet president do better. But still, they tried to turn it into Transgression Sunday instead of celebrating Easter. It is a declared war now on Christians. And if you are Christian, make no mistake about it, you are now in a war. Biden issued a White House proclamation Friday. He called upon Americans to join him in, quote, lifting up the lives and voices of transgender people throughout our nation, end quote. And on Easter Sunday, Biden followed that up with a post on X telling Americans that transgender people are, quote, made in the image of God, end quote. Good to know that the cognitively impaired and politically corrupt president has some idea of religion and the place of God. The Biden White House also banned religious artwork from the White House Easter egg art contest, if you can imagine. This is venal. 
This is evil, folks, and make no mistake about it. This war is not going to have any relief until one side or the other wins. And right now, evil is winning out. The rule states that eggs, quote, must not include any questionable content, religious symbols, overtly religious themes, or partisan political statements. What happened to that uh, transgender uh, visibility day? So it's clear Joe Biden is a blasphemous disgrace who is worshiping at the altar of the radical LGBT agenda. By the way, if you're wondering how many days of celebration the LGBT uh, group has, uh, it's 50. 50 days of celebration each year for something related to LGBTQ. Did you hear that, my friends? In this nation, we celebrate 50 days out of the year. We celebrate the sexually immoral. 50 days out of the year, they are recognized. 50 days out of the year, they are worshipped. 50 days out of the year, they are recognized. My friends, that's, that's, that is quadruple all of God's feast days all put together. Now, I want to say this. I have great respect for Lou Dobbs. I think he's a very intelligent man. But we cannot talk about who God loves versus who God hates without examining what is going on within the confines of our own world in our own time, in order to see with great clarity, I might add, the hypocrisy of not only the unbelieving and the atheist and the agnostic and the homosexual and the adulterer, but also the hypocrisy of those who claim to be Christian. Today in our time, we see those who claim to be Christians, rising up in arms because of the President of the United States stepping all over their pagan celebration of Easter. Think about that for just a moment, if you will. Now, my friends, I tell you the truth, as Christians, we have many fights that we need to fight. Is this one of them? Is this one of them? For a true, God-fearing, Messiah-following, cross-bearing Christian, this is no fight for us. This is laughable. It is ignorance and hypocrisy in all of its glory. We show this all the time, but once again, I feel compelled to share this commandment with you here this evening, I want to go and uh, I want to sh share with you once again the same scripture we show over and over and over again. There's three different scripture here. I just want to pull these uh, for you. Uh, it is a uh, a commandment not to add to God's word or to take away from God's word. And many Christians today forget this. They have no concept of this. Deuteronomy chapter four verse two: You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahuwah your God that I command you. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, Every word of, uh, word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Now, with that bedrock under our feet, for all you professing Christians and professing Christian pastors and priests and rabbis and popish leaders out there who are attacking President Joe Biden for turning your pagan Roman Catholic Easter celebration into transgression day, I want you to show me where the celebration of a pagan fertility goddess dressed up as a rabbit 
that magically craps colored eggs all over the church lawn is found anywhere within the confines of your God-breathed scripture. Let me say that again. I want you, Christian, you, pastor, you, rabbi, you, pope, you show me where the celebration of a pagan fertility goddess dressed up as a rabbit that magically craps colored eggs all over the church lawn is found anywhere within the confines of your God-breathed scripture. I'll wait right here. Someone please enlighten me by placing the commandment to keep a pagan Easter celebration honoring a Roman Catholic fertility goddess dressed up as a rabbit that magically uses divination and sorcery to crap colored eggs all over the church lawn in the chat room, please. Did President Joe Biden crap all over your pagan celebration? Oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. Not. My friends, it's time for Christians to grow up. It's time for Christians to know what's in their Bible, but just as importantly, as we say so many times over and over and over again, to know and understand what's not, what's not written in the Bible. To add or to take away is a sin. It's a transgression. It's a turning back like a dog to its vomit and like a pig to its mire. I'd like to show you something over at our website. Very important. Did you know that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all agree that our Messiah died on Preparation Day? which was also known as Passover Day, which is kept in preparation of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Did you know that? Did our Messiah die on a Roman Catholic-created Good Friday? Show me that in your Bible. Once again, my friends, show me. Show me. Where is that written in your Bible? Is that not adding to God's Word and taking away from God's Word? Is that in of itself not a sin? I'm going to take you over to our website. I'm going to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John so that you can understand that according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all agree that our Messiah died on Preparation Day, which was also known as Passover Day, because Passover was in preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Let me show you where those scriptures are so that you can show your family these things, and you yourself can be aware of these and not duped by the devil who loves to dress himself up like an angel of light. Once again, my friends. Now, here, you can get here. This is our website, Holy Impact Ministries. All you have to do is click on the Feast Day calendar and come down to the Passover. And you, because if you forget where these scriptures are, you don't know where they are, you can find them very quickly. Go to holyimpactministries.com, Feast Day, Passover. Scroll down here, and right here they are. Matthew. Let me read this. Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 through 64. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And they said, Sir, we remember that the imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, and he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. What day was it? The next day, that is, after the day of preparation. That's when the chief priests come and ask Pilate. Wait, so when did Yeshua die? According to Matthew, day of preparation. Mark, chapter 15, verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. What Sabbath is he talking about? He's talking about the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's not talking about the seventh-day Sabbath. He's talking about the high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, according to Leviticus chapter 23, are both high days when no work is to be done. It was known as a high Sabbath, right? Again, let's read Mark, you, Mark chapter 15, verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, and he went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Yeshua. When did uh, Yeshua die? According to Mark, the day of preparation, also known as Passover day. That's the day they prepared to eat the Passover that evening at twilight. Luke. Luke chapter 23, verse 54, it was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. Again, read Leviticus chapter 23, you know that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which comes immediately after, after the Passover meal, is a high Sabbath. What day was it, according to Luke? The day of preparation. The women had come uh, from Galilee with him, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Was he dead? Yes. When did he die? He died, according to Luke, on the day of preparation. John chapter 19, verse 31, since it was the day of preparation. And so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that day was a high day. Again, a high Sabbath, not a regular Sabbath. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and it might take him away. And of course, they did not do that. They scourged him. But again, according to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there it is, my friends. They all agree that our Messiah died on Preparation Day, which was the day of Passover, before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's when our Messiah died, not on some Roman Catholic created Good Friday. The true Son of God, who is Yeshua, was raised up after three days and three nights. He did not die on a Roman Catholic a pagan Good Friday as those who bow the knee to the Roman Catholic Pope of Rome so proudly proclaim. Again, my friends, let's go back. All we have to do is slide down here a little bit farther. And uh, what do we see here? Again, Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Get that, my friends. Three days and three nights. You do not get three days and three nights from a Friday crucifixion, my friends. It is written that our true Messiah and King, who is the only begotten Son of Jehovah God, was, is, and always will be our Passover Lamb, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, from the Apostle Paul himself. Let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Cleanse out the old leaven, the old sin, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened without sin. For Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival. What festival? The festival of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Not with the old leaven, the old sin, the old sin of malice and evil, but with the unleavened, the sinless bread. Of sincerity and truth, says the Apostle Paul. My friends, her name was Artemis in Ephesus. We need to understand that. We need to know that, my friends. Again, let me go back here so that you might understand these things. Her name was Artemis in Ephesus, but it was Astroth in the Hebrew language, Astarte in the Phoenician language, Ishtar in the Akkadian language, Astre in the Anglo-Saxon language, and Easter in the English language. Though she had many different names throughout history, the symbols of Artemis, Easter, were always the same, no matter what name she was known by. It was always rabbits and eggs, and she often was depicted with bare breasts, hence the goddess of fertility theme that she carried with her throughout the ages. My friends, I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And I'd like to just examine this, if we can. Our Messiah and King had a lot to say about the pastors of his time, who at that time were the Pharisees and the scribes and the high priests. As we can clearly see here in Matthew chapter 23, our Messiah and King has left us with a whirlwind of warnings about our so-called pastors and priests and rabbis today in our time, who are no different than these of his time. As we can see, our Messiah and King had all kinds of pet names for the so-called men of God of his time. 
And I just want to go through here, and I just want to look at that. I've taken the high, I've taken the the opportunity here to to highlight some of these pet names in green. He says these are the, what we know in Matthew chapter twenty three is the seven woes to the pastors of his time, the priests of his time, the Pharisees of his time, the rabbis of his time, the high priest, the, the popish leaders of his time. These are the seven woes of Yeshua to them. What does he say? What names did he call them? The first thing he says here is not to be called rabbi. You're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you're all brothers. He's to call no man your spiritual father on earth, for you only have one father who's in heaven. And don't be called anyone's master. That word there is uh, not instructors, it is master, for you have one master, the Christ. The greatest among you should be your servant. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites. He called him a child of hell. He says, you travel over land and sea to make a single follower. And when you do, and he becomes a follower, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. He says, you blind guides, you blind fools, you blind men, you hypocrites, 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 whitewashed tombs, lawless, lawless, you're lawless. Sons of those who murdered the prophets, you serpents, you serpents, you brood of vipers. Who was he calling this? The men of God, the pastors, the priests, the high priests, the popish leaders of his time. And look at the one name that he used the most, my friends, was hypocrite. And I've taken the opportunity here to, to highlight this in blue. How many times he call them hypocrites? Hypocrites, 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 hypocrites. How many times? One, two, three, four, five, six times just here in Matthew chapter 23 alone. The word that he called him the most was hypocrite, claiming to be men of God. They had made void the word of God in order to hold on to their own traditions. Why do you think this is recorded for us to see? Why do you think this is recorded for us to see in our time? Do you think this is recorded for no reason? Why do you think it is that our Messiah wanted this in our God-breathed scripture for us to see? My friends, God hates a hypocrite. And these false prophets who have filled the land this very day need to understand the transgressions that they have manifested in the eyes of God this very day, all the while crying out that the president, what the president did to their pagan Easter celebration that was made, that in of itself has made void the word of God in order to hold on to their own traditions. They cry out about how terrible the president is, and then they turn around and they, what do they do? What do they do? They chastise others. They themselves turn right to their pagan Easter goddess and teach their children to color her pagan fertility eggs as they stuff chocolate down the throats of their children, something sweet in the mouth to cover up the vile putrid proclamations of Roman Catholicism, who is their mother church of Rome, who has created Easter, the great harlot who rides the beast that is an amalgamation of all false pagan religions that add to and take away from God's word. But then again, it's written, that there's nothing new under the sun, is it not? Jeremiah chapter 23, oddly enough, is also a chapter that proclaims our Messiah and King. Although I would encourage everyone to read all of Jeremiah chapter 23, due to time constraints here this evening, I'd like to focus on Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 9 through 21. Let's go read that once again to make sure that we are standing on solid ground. Scripture and Scripture only. Sola Scriptura. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 11 through 17. And again, all of this is about our Messiah. This is, uh, this is all about Yeshua. But I want to read down here where it talks about lying prophets that were, again, that were alive and well even in Jeremiah's time, even before Messiah's time. Listen close to this about what is prophesied about lying prophets. It says, both prophet and priest are, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 11, both prophet and priest are ungodly, 
Even in my house I have found their evil, declares Jehovah. My friends, is there ungodliness in God's house today? You bet. Are they dragging in pagan things into God's house and God's sanctuary? You bet. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares Jehovah. Therefore, their, their way shall be to them like slippery paths in darkness, into which they shall be driven and fall. For I will bring disaster upon them in the year of their punishment, declares Jehovah. In the year of their punishment, when do you suppose that's coming? You do know that the eclipse is coming this Monday evening, yes? Let's continue. In the prophets of Samaria I saw an unsavory thing. They prophesied by Baal, and they led my people Israel astray. But the prophets of Jerusalem I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me, and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Therefore, thus says Jehovah of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with bitter food and give them poison water to drink. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has gone out into all the land. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes that they speak visions of in their own minds, not from the mouth of Jehovah. They say continuously to those who despise the word of Yahuwah, It shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, No disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the council of Yahuwah to see, to hear his word, and to his, who has paid attention to his word, and who has listened? Behold the storm of Yahuwah. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of Yahovah will not turn back until he is executed and accomplish the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly, my friends. Those days are coming. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. In the end, before criticizing the President of the United States for walking all over your pagan Easter celebration, you may want to remove the log that's in your own eye. For only then will you realize that President Joe Biden, who is a Roman Catholic, has no idea when the Son of God was resurrected. And even if he did, no man can erase or change what God himself, through his Passover lamb, has already done. Friends, there is so much to know here, so much to, uh, to understand here. Uh, I wish that we had much, much more time, but we just don't. In, in one setting, a lot of people just don't have the patience to sit through a whole lot of things. But I want us to understand this. God hates a hypocrite. Messiah's favorite pet name, of which he had many for the pastors of his time, was hypocrite. Adding to God's word, taking away from God's word, is a sin. This coming Monday evening, April 8th, a Paleo-Hebrew Aleph and Tav will be written across the face of the United States. The beginning and the end is giving us a warning. How many warnings do we need? How many blood moons have fallen on his feast days? How many signs in the sun, moon, and stars do you need to see? In the latter days, 
you will understand it clearly. Which brings us back to those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, and those who do not. Many will be called, but only few will be chosen. Straight is the gate, narrow is the path, and few, not many, few there be that find it. My friends, are you reading your Bible? Are you reading your Bible for yourself? Please, my friends, read your Bible. With that being said, uh, I would just like to say one more thing to everybody within the sound of my voice. Please, my friends, please, take what you have heard here this evening to your own prayer closet. Bow your head, bend your knee, face the holy promised land of Jerusalem, and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if what you have heard here today be true or not. Ask, seek, and knock on His door and his door alone, not on the door of a man, on his door and his door alone, so that the proper door can be opened unto you. And my friends, if you will do that, and if you will stay the course to the end, you and I will surely walk through the gates of his soon coming kingdom together. Understand the parable. Understand the spiritual speech that your Passover lamb spoke. With that being said, everybody, we're going to say a quick prayer and we will adjourn for this evening. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, blessed and holy is your name, high and far above all names. We give you thanks, Father, for these scriptures that we have here today today to use as a compass, as a way to navigate through the darkness of this world and the fights that are being fought that don't need to be fought versus the fights that do need to be fought. Help us to stay focused, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Lead us, guide us. Keep your protective hand over us. Give us your tenacity and the longevity that we need to not only endure to the end, but to conquer over evil as we go. Help us to remember that we are to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth that preserves your spoken word. Help us to preserve it. Help us to teach it. Help us to shout it. Speak through us. Allow us to do what it is that needs to be done in order to expand your soon coming kingdom in these very dark last days. Help us to expand that kingdom. Messiah Yeshua, we, we beg of you, we ask you, use us as you will and help us to just simply endure through whatever it is that we must endure through. In closing, may your will, Father, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Once again, everybody, God bless you. Thank you so very much for joining me. I appreciate you. And uh, we will be back this coming Saturday with another study uh, that uh, we are still working on. So I'm not going to let that out of the bag just yet. Again, my friends, Eclipse coming Monday. Uh, we are calling for a day of fast. Please join us for that day of fast to pray for this nation. Uh, if you are in another nation, please pray. We will be praying for all nations uh, within that fast. No matter where you're at, you're Canada, you're in Mexico, you're in the Philippines, you're wherever you are, we're going to be praying for your country as well. We are praying for the assembly of God and for the nations in which our assembly uh, resides in, that we might shine brightly in these dark days. So please, my friends, join us for that. Uh, again, it begins Sunday sundown uh, to Monday sundown. Uh, with that being said, everybody, God bless you. Thank you so very, very much.
We will see you next time. Shalom.